Well, for a few moments, I want us to look at what uh, this really important area. Uh, you might want to pull out your outlines uh, to follow with me as we uh, go through this this morning. And I want to talk about, really, just the profound nature of the death of Christ. There is a danger that we, uh, we uh, remember Christ. We remember him uh, uh, many times, uh, particularly around the communion table. But the danger is, is that because perhaps if we've been around church many years, that uh, we can forget just the, about the significance of the cross. We can forget about all that Christ did in the sense of what was going on. And we can have a surface level understanding and actually not realize that there are major theological, major things that are taking place at the cross that we need to understand, which I think makes what Christ did a richer, uh, a more profound, a more awesome uh, event in all that he did for us. And so I want us to look at something that's really important, and it, it is this. Why Jesus took my, why Jesus took your place on the cross. And the word for that is a great theological word, and the word is substitution. Because Jesus was on the cross for six hours, as we just read. They nailed him to the cross at nine in the morning, and then around three o'clock in the afternoon, he had died. At about noon, everything gets dark. Between noon and three, they're normally the brightest hours of the day, aren't they? But we find here, as Matthew tells us, that, that God brings this, this covering of darkness for the final three hours of Jesus' death as he is suffering on the cross. We find the story, as I read to you, in Matthew 27, 45, 46. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land. And the word darkness here is the word skotos in Greek, and it literally means obscurity. Now, we don't know what God did at this point. The Bible writers don't tell us that. Whether God just brought in some clouds or, or a storm or maybe an eclipse, whatever it was, we don't know. But it was very, very dark in the middle of the day. Um, we had that partial eclipse, didn't we, uh, a few weeks ago. And if you were there, it was a strange concept, wasn't it? If you remember the eclipse in 1999, I think it was, when you experienced that, what a strange experience that is. Well, imagine that for three hours. No wonder they were terrified at that point. We read, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. And the Greek word here means he screamed. In other words, Jesus screams literally at the top of his lungs. And he says this, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is Aramaic for, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is substitution at that point. And it's the most shocking word when you think about it. Uh, why have you forsaken me? And forsaken means deserted. It means rejected. It means abandoned. It means let go. It means forsaken. And we know, don't we, personally as human beings, nothing hurts more than abandonment, than rejection. And Jesus, in the last 24 hours, is progressively abandoned by everybody. First, he's abandoned by Judas, then he is abandoned by, his, by the disciples. They all flake out except John, who shows up here at the cross. Then at this point, Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is going on here? Jesus became our substitute. At this moment, he took the penalty for our sins. He took the punishment for everything that we have done wrong, that you will ever do wrong. In other words, he assumes your place. He died in your place. He substitutes himself for our guilt. And he, at this point, is taking on all the sins of the world on himself. In fact, the Bible says it like this in 1 John 2, verse 2. He, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He is saying here the sins of everybody. He poured into him all the sins of the world. He says, I'm going to take them on myself and I'm going to die on the cross for them. He is substituting himself. Now, if you want to see those words, you might even want to circle it in that verse there, the words atoning sacrifice. What is atonement? Atonement means, in its most simplest form, atonement means payment for damages done. It's compensation, in other words, for your sin. It is satisfying the law of God. It is satisfying justice that something wrong doesn't just get to go scot-free. There must be a payment. There must be a retribution, a restitution, an atonement, a paying back. 
It's what justice demands. That is what atonement is. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but the sins of the whole world. How does that happen? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God took the sinless Christ, remember, he never sinned, and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, and this is the great exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. That's an incredible verse when you just stop and think about that for a minute. That is the great exchange that God took the sinless Christ, the one who never sinned, and poured into him our sins. And you think about the sins you've committed. And you think about the sins of the world. You think about the real evil that we see. And they are poured on Christ. And then in this dramatic, dramatic great exchange, when we come to Christ, our sins are taken from us, and the goodness, the righteousness of Christ is poured into us. That's a great mystery. That is substitution. Now, what does it teach us? I want us to look this morning at what substitution teaches us, and then what should be our response, which will lead us into communion. As we think about substitution, what do we learn? We learn three things. First of all, we learn. We learn that God is holy. God is holy. Revelation 4, 8 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. The one true God who created the universe is holy. What does that mean? It means he is 100% pure, untainted, uncorrupted, and incorruptible. He is 100% perfect. That's what God is. He is holy. Because, you see, an imperfect God is no God at all. An imperfect God is not worthy of our worship. God is ultimate perfection in every area. And because God is perfect, he cannot stand to be in the presence of imperfection. Because God is holy, he hates evil. Because God is holy, he won't even look on that which is corrupted as, or evil or wrong. God is pure perfection. Habakkuk 1.13 says, Your eyes, Lord, are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. That's why there's no sin in heaven. There is no wrong, no suffering, no sadness, no sickness, because God is perfect. Now, on the cross, Jesus came to earth, God in human form, to die for our sins. He took every sin of all mankind's history on himself, every evil thing ever done in history, and at this point, Jesus is taking them upon himself. So verse 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, 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 Lamech Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that moment, God the Father, who, remember, is holy, looks away. Because he cannot look at his own son when his son is taking on the sin of the world. So when we look at the cross, what we see is we see divine separation. We see this in God's sovereign departure. It's an inexplicable occurrence. One we will never fully be able to understand. God's furious anger over sin is poured out totally on Christ. It was as if God accumulated all of his anger against all of the sins of all the ages and poured it all out on Christ. But as that sin-bearing judgment comes to a climax, Jesus gathers his strength, enough strength, to cry out from his heart. And he cries out about a profound sense of separation from God, too deep for us to understand. My God, my God. And there is an intimacy in that. There is a tenderness in that. And there is pathos in that. My God, my God. And he's saying, in effect, you're mine. Where, where did you go? And then he says, Lamech Sabachthani, why have you left me? Why have you departed from me? You see, the cry demonstrates that he, at this point, was separated from God. Now, 
how can God and Christ be one and also be separated? Well, that is the mystery of the separation. And, you know, theologians, theologians have been discussing this and been debating this through the centuries, and they can never explain this because we cannot explain what, in essence, is really the union of the Trinity. So how, could, how can we explain what the separation would, is? You say, did Jesus cease to become God? No. Did Jesus get cut off from the nature of God? No. But did Jesus cease to have fellowship with God? Yes. He was separated from the fellowship of the Father, though not the nature of the Father. He was still God. He did not cease to be God. Now, what is the great truth that we see in this? What, what, what do we learn here? Well, we learn that the holiness of God is the issue in the separation. On the one hand, God pours out his, his wrath in judgment on sin, while on the other hand, he turns his back on sinners because he has to protect his perfect holiness. He had to turn away from Christ because Christ became sin. And so God turns his back. 1 John 1, 5, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. He cannot look at evil, and those who are guilty sinners are cut off, and they are separated from the holy God. And God had to forsake Jesus, because God was holy, and Jesus was, as it were, sin personified at that moment. Fellowship was broken, and a gulf existed between the Father and the Son when the Son bore sin. And the point I want you to understand is the fact that God separated himself from Christ and it indicates that Jesus did indeed become sin at that point. That Jesus became sin and was our substitute, as proved by the Father's departure. But even though Jesus was engulfed in sin so that, that he literally became sin itself, he still cries out to God. On the one hand, he is fully sin. On the other hand, he is still without sin in his own person. And it's the mystery again of this substitutionary death. He bore sin, but not for a second did he desire it. And not for a second did, was it really his own. His desire was God. It was always God. And even while he's bearing the curse, and even while he's engulfed in all this sin, he thirsts for God. He thirsts for communion with God because that's the truest part of him. How many times did God, did Jesus spend time praying to his Father while he was here on earth? Christ was personally fully bearing sin and that's why he was cut off and he was separated from God, his Father. And at this moment, he's separated from God and because God's holiness, as it were, sort of steps back and says, I, I can't be a part of this. And he cries out, why have you forsaken me? Because God is holy. The second thing we learn is that sin is ugly. Sin is ugly. Now, we really don't think it's ugly because we live in a society today that uh, says, well, you know, the, the, the books, the, the movies, the songs, it, it makes sin attractive. It makes it look popular, doesn't it? It makes it look appealing, doesn't it? It makes it look pleasing, makes it look like everybody's doing it. I mean, let's be honest, only a, funny, a fuddy-duddy would sort of keep all the rules and keep all the commands of God. So we actually think that sin is not ugly. But if you want to see the true consequences of sin, if you want to see the damage of it, you look at the cross. Because Jesus is taking the guilt for every evil thing, everything ever done wrong, every lie, every sin, every dishonesty, every betrayal, every mean thing ever done, and he's taken it on himself. And that is the cross. And it is hideous. It is horrible. It is horrific. It is a gruesome sight. You see, sin alienates us from God. Sin always breaks the relationship. It creates distance between us and God. It separates us. It estranges us from God. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, Your evil has separated you from your God, and your sins have caused him to turn away from you. Have you ever felt, have you, do you ever feel like sometimes when you're praying that your prayers just aren't getting above the ceiling? They're just sort of bouncing off? Maybe. 
Maybe it's because at that point you're probably separated from God because there's sin in your life at that point. An unconfessed sin, maybe. <coughs> you're not as close to God as you could be. Because sin alienates us from God. Sin also condemns us. When, when you violate God's holy law, there is always a penalty and you live with God's condemnation. Psalm 7 verse 11 says it like this. God is a righteous judge and he always condemns the wicked. It says here, God is a righteous judge. What does righteous mean? Righteous means this. God is always right. God is always fair. God always tells the truth. God is always perfect. God is always impartial. God is a righteous judge. That means when God says something about you, it is true. You may not like it, but it is true. Because God doesn't lie. And when God says something right about you, he is right about you because he knows you, he made you, he created you, he is a righteous judge. Now God only judges one thing, and that is sin. Because that's all there is to judge. There is a divine judgment on sin that's taken place at the cross. And as you look at the cross of Christ, it's not just a good man making a noble effort to sacrifice himself for a cause in which he believed in. It is the judgment of God taking place here. God is at work here, and God is judging sin at that point. That's why Romans 4.25 says, He was delivered over to death for our sins. And that's why 1 Corinthians 15.3 says, Christ died for our sins. That's why 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That's why 1 Peter 4.18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. And that great verse, 1 John 4 verse 10, This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins sins and Jesus knew this was the reason why he came he said he came to die he came to bear sin and Jesus here on the cross is being judged by God's wrath God's fury was poured out on him as he bore in his body all the sins of the people this is the judgment of God on the one who is bearing sin and since Christ was absolutely sinless, his sin must have been ours. Romans 6.23 says this, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, here's the good news, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, wages is something you earn, isn't it? A gift is something you're given. I have earned death. I should be punished for my sins. You should be punished for your sins. Somebody's going to have to be punished for them, either you or somebody else. And Jesus says, I volunteer. I will pay the penalty for your sins so you don't have to pay them. And that's good news, isn't it, friends? Now, let me be real clear here. Our biggest problem in life is that we are at war with God. And that creates separation and condemnation in our lives. You say, well, I'm, I'm not at war at God, with God. You, you are. Every day you're making decisions about who is going to run your life, you or God. When I decide, I know God says do this, but I'm going to do what I want to do, I'm going to do that, then I'm saying I know better than God. That means I'm at war with God. It means I'm in rebellion. It means I'm saying, God, I know what you said to do, but I'm going to do what I want to do because I know what I think, I know what makes me more happy more than you do. And I know you said don't do this, but I'm going to do this anyway. <coughs> at that point, you're at war with God. And that causes all kinds of problems, doesn't it, in our lives. The cross shows the seriousness and the destructiveness and the ugliness of sin. God is holy, sin is ugly. Third thing we learn is that salvation is costly. In other words, it costs God a whole lot. Salvation is very costly. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. It is a free gift. Yes, salvation is free, but it is not cheap because somebody, the Lord Jesus Christ, had to pay for it. And his name here was Jesus. Romans 3.25 says this. God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. Why? 
Because remember, we're in rebellion against him. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing his life for us. You see, both justice and mercy have to be served at the same time. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. Justice, God's holiness, and sin must be judged. Evil must be punished. Yet mercy says, I will do the punishment. I will pay the penalty. And the amazing thing about your salvation is it is 100% God's idea. 100% God does it all. All we do is we accept it. God takes care of paying your debt. God gave himself. He took the initiative. So Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. In other words, the curse was that we deserve to be punished for the things that we've done wrong in life. But when he was hung on the cross... He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoings. Nobody is ever going to love you more than God does. Nobody's ever going to love you or sacrifice more for you than Jesus Christ has. So what should be my response to these things? Three things. First of all, I need to turn from my sin and trust Jesus to save me. See, that's what this is all about, isn't it? There's no other way I'm going to get into heaven. Don't believe the lies that all roads lead to God. They don't. Jesus is the only one who paid. He's the only one who died. So I need to turn from my sin and trust Jesus to save me. Romans 3.22 says it like this. We are made right in God's sight when we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in this same way, no matter who we are or what we have done. Notice, no matter who we are or what we've done. Isn't that a great verse? Aren't you thankful for that verse in the Bible? You can be forgiven if you trust him to take away your sins. Hebrews 10, 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, we know what Jesus has done for us. No sacrifice for our sins is, no sacrifice for our sins is left for us. What does that mean? It means that if I reject what Jesus did on the cross for me, there is no other alternative. There isn't a plan B. In other words, there's no hope for me. There's no other way to be saved. No other way to get in heaven. That is it. If I don't accept Jesus, he then becomes my judge. Secondly, I need to live in a state of gratitude when I understand what God has already done for me. Gratitude for all he has done. How could you not love somebody who loves you this much that he died on the cross for you? And how could you walk away from that? Romans 5.11 says, Now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. In other words, we're no longer at war with God. We're no longer an enemy of God. The war is over. All because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in making us friends of God. How could you not love Jesus? He deserves your total love, your total gratitude, your eternal appreciation. Thirdly, when I'm tempted to sin, I need to remember what my sin cost Jesus. And that will cause me to pause before I step into that trap. So when I am tempted, I pause and think about that sin put Jesus on the cross. The next time I start to be horrible to somebody, I think that sin put Jesus on the cross. The next time I start to be self-centered and treat others in a selfish way, I think that sin put Jesus on the cross. The next time I start to launch out and attack somebody or put them down or be mean-spirited or whatever, I think that sin put Jesus on the cross. The next time I'm tempted to lie, I think that sin put Jesus on the cross. 1 Peter 1.18 and 19 says, God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. The ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver, he paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God has to punish sin. God became the substitutionary sin bearer who takes the punishment. And because he loves you and wants to be merciful and gracious to you, he gives up his life for you and for me. And as a result of that, access to the presence of God is wide open to all who will come to him through Christ. We need to remember what it cost Jesus. 
And we're going to do that now as we spend some time around the communion table. Before we do, let me lead you in a prayer. Let's pray. Maybe you just want to pray, echo these words that I'm going to pray and lead us in. Dear Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you're not just a God of justice, you're a God of mercy. I don't deserve to be forgiven for the things I've done wrong, I know that. But I thank you for your love and I thank you for your grace and I thank you for dying for me. Today I realise how costly it was for you. I want to live my life in a state of gratitude that if you never did anything else for me, I owe you the rest of my life. And Lord, when I'm tempted to do things that I know aren't right, help me to remember that it was those sins that put you on the cross. Most important of all, help me to share the good news with other people, to care enough to tell others about the great work you did on the cross. I pray all these things in your name.